Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Toxicology, astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Krishnil Singh uses biomimicry to heal bones. But first up, Here's the news. Ultrasound keeps brains young. As I reported last year at the Clem Jones Center for Aging Dementia Research at the Queensland Brain Institute, Professor Jürgen Getz showed that exposing the brains of mice with Alzheimer's disease a scanning ultrasound caused the brain to flush out the plaques, characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, and recover some of the lost ability to learn. This year, he and his team were testing the safety of the scanning ultrasound treatment and found that not only did it hurt the healthy brains of mice, but it protected them from changes in the structure of brain cells that cause cognitive problems in aging brains. They weren't looking for it, but the researchers have found a way to make brains age more slowly. As the brains of mammals age, the structure of neuronal cells in the hippocampus part of the brain associated with memory reduces, causing problems with the way humans and mice learn and remember. Regularly scanning the mouse's brains with ultrasound to look for damage turned out to stop these changes. Last week, I reported that the neuronal structural changes in the brains of aging fruit flies were reversed by feeding the flies a nutritional supplement of spermidine. In the fruit flies, the neuronal structures got bigger as they aged, rather than getting smaller as they do in mice. The researchers used patch clamp electrodes to examine neuronal structure in the mice 2 and 24 hours after a single scanning ultrasound treatment, and 1 week and 3 months after 6 weekly scanning ultrasound treatments, including sham treatments as controls. The mouse brains exposed to scanning ultrasound didn't show any reduction in neuronal structure. They stayed the same size as in the young mice. The mice given sham treatments aged normally. It's possible that in the same way that the ultrasound scans last year triggered the brain's recycling process to clear out the misfolded protein plaques of Alzheimer's, so this year's ultrasound scans of healthy aged mouse brains triggered them into recycling waste that would normally cause the structure to change and hinder memory encoding. The next step in the research will be to test the effects of ultrasound on older healthy mice. The original Alzheimer's disease treatment with ultrasound scans is scheduled for clinical trials with humans in another year or two. Perhaps future experiments will show that those mice, and perhaps someday humans, whose brains have started ageing can have the ageing reversed with spermidine, like the fruit flies, and then keep their brain's memory young with regular ultrasound scans. Or maybe the ultrasound will prove to be as good or better than spermidine. Perhaps if the ultrasound treatment works to halt ageing in human brains, the scanning ultrasound could be built into headphones. The paper was titled, Scanning Ultrasound Causes No Changes to Neuronal Excitability and Prevents Age-Related Reductions in Hippocampal CA1 Dendritic Structure in Wild-Type Mice, and was published in the journal Public Library of Science, 1. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Biomimicry. Krishnil Singh works at the University of Technology, Sydney, in the School of Life Sciences. His project is trying to turn stem cells harvested from people's fat into bone using coral. 
he gave a talk about his research into biomimicry and coral for Inspiring Australia at Ultimo Library. I visited him and began by asking, what is biomimicry? Biomimicry is a philosophy where we look at nature for blueprints. So we can identify ways or different ways nature uses mechanisms to do a particular idea to survive. So for example, sharks, uh, they live in a large reservoir which is full of bacteria. They can actually avoid bacterial infections because of the way their skin is shaped. And so we look at the shape of the shark skin and then we try to mimic that in a whole new medical device such as trying to make prosthetics that can probably in the future prevent infections. And do we know the mechanism of how the shark skin stops the infection? Yes, they do. So our researchers two years ago found that it's the actual shape of the shark skin that prevents the bacteria from dividing on top of it. Generally, when bacteria divide, they like to form little, little housing called biofilms. And sometimes different surfaces can affect the, the effectiveness of the housing, which is biofilms. So they found the shark skin, it prevented how well those biofilms formed. And this bacteria that they tested it on was MRSA, which is a huge problem in, in hospital-acquired community diseases. It sounds like something that'd be useful in like bathrooms and kitchens. Yes, yeah, it can be useful in a lot of household appliances as well. I mean, recently antibody resistance is a huge problem, and so finding alternatives to antibiotics to curb bacteria infections and diseases, we can see this is a whole new breakthrough in the field of science. And you're looking at healing bones using biomimicry. Yeah, that's correct. So our idea of biomimicry or bioinspiration is looking at coral because coral, if you've ever, ever seen coral, it looks very similar to bones. And the reason why it looks very similar to bones because chemically it is similar to bones as well. So the inorganic part of our own bones is called hydroxyapatite. And hydroxyapatite is also the same thing that coral is made of as well. So when I say coral, I'm talking about dead coral. So not in, there's no living organisms inside the coral. After a coral has grown and lived its life, it passes away and it lives behind its exoskeleton, very similar to how we leave our skeletons behind. And so our, the idea behind our research is to utilize that coral to one day heal someone's bones using the stem cells that are found inside the fat. And we, so we have stem cells in the fat of our body. What does our body use those stem cells for, to make more fat? <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good idea. Uh, Good question. So the fat, the stem cells that are found inside our fat are usually yep, turned into what's called adipocytes. So adipocytes are the cells that collect the fat around our body and hold it for us. And so our body likes to keep a large amount of these stem cells because due to our diet, we generally have a lot of a lot of energy that our body likes to store in the form of fat. So glucose, which is what we use as an energy source, gets stored in the body as fat. And so our body makes a large number of stem cells to hold those. And up to 10 years ago, a number of researchers found that these stem cells that are found in our fat can actually be turned into other different things like muscle, cartilage tissue, neurons, and even bone as well, which is why we got the idea of using these stem cells that are found in the fat instead of alternative sources of stem cells, such as the ones that are sourced from bone marrow or even more uh, controversially embryonic stem cells as well. We try to avoid using those. So how do you extract the stem cells from the fat and be sure that they're stem cells and not fat cells? Excellent question. So what we do is we work in collaboration with a plastic surgeon um, in Sydney who gives us, uh, with, with the patient consent, liposuction from uh, different people. And so we get the liposuction stem cells and then we spin them out and then we separate the stem cells from the fat. And to make sure that they uh, contain their stemness, if, as I should like to call them, uh, we run through a whole number of uh, different medical uh, techniques like flow cytometry. So flow cytometry identifies the surface markers of a stem cell. So a surface marker essentially is uh, flags that a cell would have to say what they are. So a surface marker, for example, a white blood cell will be different to a surface marker, for example, that a muscle cell might have. So researchers have found that stem cells, generally all around the world, all have these unique CD markers that we call them, these flags, saying them, hey, look at me, I'm actually a stem cell. And so we look at those and we find that these cells actually have those markers that other stem cells would normally have. And from that, we can then deduce that 
if these actually are stem cells, maybe we can turn them. And actually they would have the properties that stem cell would have, such as self-renewal and the ability to be pluripotent, which is a scientific term that we call the ability to transform or differentiate into other cells. And so researchers have done this. Ten years ago, they have turned these stem cells found in the fat into bone, into bone cells, into uh, cardio or cartilage cells, and even muscle cells as well. And what does it take to turn these stem cells into bone cells? Um, so stem cells are very naive in a the sense they look for any kind of marker or any kind of uh, instruction to turn into something. So there's a number of ways you can turn fat stem cells into bones. You can use chemicals such as um, uh, dexamethasone, beta, uh, beta mecapto, etc, etc, etc. So there's a whole bunch of chemicals you can use to change them into bone. But this cannot be therapeutically translated because these chemicals can actually be bad for us at high dosages in our body. So instead of using chemicals, what our research lab tries to do is use coral as a way to instruct the stem cells to turn into bone. So the corals, are they instructing by the shape that the stem cells form? Yeah, that's exactly right. So what we believe is that the actual coral shape, not only the coral shape, but also the chemical composition of the coral as well is what's influencing the cells to turn into bone. When, they, when the stem cells see something that's very similar to a bone-like environment, which is essentially what our coral exoskeleton provides, they start seeing that as a sort of instruction to turn into bone. And my research is beginning to show that, that the longer they stay in the coral, the more they start, the more the stem cells start having these bone morphological uh, symptoms or uh, like bone, bone-like expression. So they, they're morphologically and they also proteomically look very similar to what a bone cell would look like, which is essentially an osteoblast. So we look at osteoblast as a bone cell, and we see what kind of proteins an osteoblast makes, and we see how close the stem cells after living in the coral for 14 and 30 days gets to looking like that particular bone cell. So these stem cells in the coral, they produce a lot of the proteins that bone cells do, but they also produce different proteins and not all of the proteins that bone cells do? That's exactly right. We don't get 100% overlap, so they're not identical to what a bone cell will look like, but they make the proteins that a bone cell would normally need to actually, actually form bone. So normally when you have a fracture in your body, your body sends bone marrow to our stem cells there, and then they differentiate into osteoblasts, which then spit out calcium, which then makes the hard part of our bone. And then they make osteoclast, which then cleans up any excess bone so that your bone can eventually grow and shorten whenever it needs to. And so what we find is that the proteins that the osteoblasts make to spit out those calcium and to shape the bone, what we call remodeling, does get expressed after the uh, stem cells live on the coral. But the 100% overlap never occurs because an osteoblast cell has been has been differentiated or originated from a bone marrow derived stem cell. So the, the cells, the, the original parent cell of those cells are different, which is, which is why they different, sometimes they express different proteins, but it's not going to be 100% overlap because they're not going to be identical to what an actual bone cell would ever be. So will they be good enough to make new bones or heal broken bones? Yeah, so that's the, what the future outcome of our project is, is to see if this is, can, can this be effectively then translated in an animal model. So what we have to do next is now take, take a mice to do some animal models where we form fractures, unfortunately, in, in rats or mice, and then apply the coral-coated stem cells onto the fracture and see if it heals, heals quicker than a normal a metallic implant on the mice would or actually just a fracture left alone on a mice would. And I guess you can't keep on getting dead coral from the sea to do this procedure when it gets into hospitals. So what will you do instead? Yeah, so to make this somewhat viable, what we have to do then is to see if it's just the actual chemical composition and the shape of the coral. And then the, making the chemical part of coral is really easy. And people have done that. They've done it in microwaves and they can do it in minutes. So you take various chemicals, you mix them together, you microwave it for five minutes, and voila, you can have hydroxyapatite, which is the inorganic part of bone. Then the next part would then be is to 3D print this into the shape or the blueprint of what the exoskeleton of the coral will look like. And so far we are in the interims of doing that. So we have, we have made the hydroxyapatite in a microwave. So we just have to find a 3D printer, print it out, and see if the stem cells behave the same way they would have as the coral 
itself would have. And if that is possible, if it is the same thing, then we no longer have to source this from coral anymore. We can just use the coral as a blueprint to make future devices that look very similar to coral, but it's also chemically very similar to coral as well. And how small structure do you need to replicate in the coral, do you think, in the 3D printed result when you're able to do that? So the shape and the size of the implant depends on what kind of fractures you're trying to heal. So they can't be microscopic because a fracture has to be held together by something, which is why implants tend to be four to five centimetres or however long they need to be to hold the fracture. So the general idea would be to 3D print the size of the actual implant to what's needed for the actual therapeutic intervention. So do you have 3D printers in mind or will they have to be designed to be able to print with this material? Yeah, we already have 3D printers in mind, yeah. So UTS has a number of 3D printers we can use and we can add different chemicals in there so they can print into any shape we want with whatever we want. And obviously there are technical limitations with that, so it has to be things that are soluble at high temperatures and things that can actually be dissolved and then eventually hardened. So technically currently what we're going to do is we use sol gel, which is which can be 3D printed, and instead we cover the solid gel with the inorganic part of coral, which is hydroxyapatite. And so how long do you think the work will take before this sort of work might be put into hospitals, into humans? <laughs> yeah, so uh, with, with most medical devices and clinical ideas, it takes a number of years. You have to make sure it's safe, you have to make sure there's... It's, it's ethically viable, not only ethically viable, you have to also make sure that in the long term it's going to do more good than harm. And so generally with clinical trials, you have to first get the animal models through. And the animal models to get the ethics for, roughly so, take a long time as well. You have to show that you're not causing more harm to the actual um, animal model uh, than anything else. You have to make sure that the animals are actually cared for properly. You have to make sure the animals are not suffering during the entire study. So we have to get the ethics approval of it first and do the animal trials, which should take about a year, a year and a half. And if we can show that it can be done in something as small as mice, then we upscale the idea and try running clinical trials, which might take about uh, about five or six years. So the translation from research to actual clinical application depends on how effective and how safe it can be. And is coral used in other medical situations? Um, not that I'm aware of. Currently it's only used for bone tissue engineering. In any other applications for coral, um, unless someone can kind of think of something else they could use it for, we're more than happy to hear about it. But other than that, uh, because of its similarity to due to similarity to bone, we're actually using it for just bone devices or bone medical devices. Okay. I have heard of someone who had an eye removed because of cancer okay. and had an artificial eye made out of coral that would move with these muscles. Oh, wow. I had no idea. So they put the, the iris on the coral? Because generally with, with eye implants, they use silkworm. Um, they use silkworm uh, tapes and they put the retina on the silkworm tapes. And the silkworm tapes allow the retina things to move a lot as well. And there's a lot of research done in actual silkworm tapes as well for like the eye. Yeah, I had no idea there was a coral research done on it. There you go. That's interesting. This was about 10 years ago. Ah, and has, they, has anything else happened with it? Did they take it any further? Oh, well, this wasn't, as far as I know, it wasn't research. This was a friend who lost his eye who had ah. it replaced with a, a coral implant. <laughs> That's so interesting. So he couldn't see out of the eye. It just helped his uh, fake eye move around. Ah, that's so cool. That's interesting. Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> so if someone at school is listening and would like to follow your career path and do something with biomimicry like this, what do you recommend they do? So... With the idea of eventually doing something in research, you have to do a bachelor's degree in research first. So you have to do a bachelor's degree in research, and then after that, you can specialize in medical research. So that's when you have your honors year, which takes about a year after your bachelor's. And then after you're doing your honors year is when you start learning the full hands-on experience of what research is like. Uh, they give you nine months, they give you a project to finish a project in nine months, write a dissertation of up to 20,000 words, and then give a presentation on it, which is essentially uh, just a 
uh, a boot camp of what research is like in a space of a year. And after that, then um, you can pursue a career in research, either as a research assistant, or if you want to um, pursue a career in and in uh, get a doctoral out of it, you can then do your uh, doctoral studies, which is eventually just a, called a PhD, where you become a PhD candidate and you do a particular research for four years, uh, up to three to four years, and in the four years, um, you bring new knowledge to the scientific field. If you want to specialize in biomimicry, then you go to different universities, email them if they have any researchers that are involved in biomimetics or biomimicry, and they'll let you know, and most researchers are keen for any kind of hands-on experience, so kind of anyone that's very interested in their field so they can do some research, uh, get some help around the lab as well so they can find new findings. What if you haven't harvested enough stem cells? Well, the interesting thing about stem cells is they have this cool ability called self-renewal. They can replicate as many times as they want, and then after they see there's too many of them, they stop growing, and that's called confluency. So what we do is, if we don't have enough stem cells um, from, uh, derived from the patient, we can then continuously grow them to as many as we need in a plastic flask inside the labs. And it's really cool. So we can essentially passage them. So passaging means that if we end up with 100 cells, we can then grow them to be 200 by the very next day. And if 200 is enough, then you can grow them to be 400. So then to, they tend to double as often as we need them to. And they, and they know when to stop as well, because once they see there's not enough space to grow around them, um, they become senescent, so they stop growing. And what is it about the shape of coral, the structure of coral, that makes it useful for growing bone-like cells? Yeah, so not only is coral uh, chemically similar to bone, but structurally it is as well because it's very porous. So porosity essentially means there's a lot of holes in bone as well, but coral has a lot of holes in it as well. And the holes allow what we call vascularization. So generally if you have some kind of fracture, your body tends to shoot blood vessels at it so it can have its little arms everywhere to send cells through. And that's what vascularization is. And coral has that porosity to allow vascularization, something that a metallic implant wouldn't have. A metallic implant is just flat and there's no holes whatsoever. And so if your body did try to heal something that's a metallic implant, it can't get through inside into the vessels. And eventually vascularization then allows for the own body to incorporate the particular implant as part of itself, something that a metal metallic implant would not allow you to do. Nature has a lot of great ideas that we can borrow from. And instead of waiting for someone to think of something clever, we can just look outside and see what, they, what, what nature is doing to try to survive. So we can borrow something they're doing to help ourselves as well. Well, Krishnil Singh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. That was Krishnil Singh from the University of Technology, Sydney, talking about using inspiration from coral to turn stem cells from fat into bone cells to heal injuries biomimicry. And a big thank you to Andrew from Melbourne for his monthly donation. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your own voice on radio? We need more people contributing stories to Diffusion. Send your contributions, congratulations, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Have a look at the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Diffusion Radio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the Community Radio Network, including 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 NVR in Nambaka Valley, and 3 NBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website www.diffusionradio.com that's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 850 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. 
subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Diffusion Radio. I am Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.